how much time did you spend waiting last year? How much time did you spend waiting at home because of COVID-19? I read recently that we spent up to one-third of our waking hours waiting. It may be waiting in line or waiting at the doctor's office or waiting for a phone call or waiting for test results or waiting for an answer from a friend. Most of us would rather do anything than wait. It is unfortunate that some people would rather do the wrong thing than wait. Truth be told, most of life is waiting. Waiting for an appointment, waiting to graduate, waiting to be accepted to college, waiting for your first job offer, waiting for the right time to start a family, waiting for your test scores, waiting for your loved ones to come to Christ, waiting for the Lord to bring the right man or the right woman okay, into your life, waiting to find out what God wants you to do, waiting for someone to buy your house, waiting for your prayers to be answered, waiting for your husband to come from uh, to come home from business trip, waiting for your child to come back to the Lord. Waiting is one of the hardest parts of the Christian life. People usually act when they cannot wait anymore. We think waiting is nothing more than passive resignation, giving into our circumstances, throwing up our hands in despair, and walking off the playing field. We don't wait for the Lord because we think waiting means giving up. Friends, waiting is not passive. If this is our belief that waiting is giving up or doing nothing, this only shows how little we understand or how, we, how, little, how we, uh, little we know about the Bible and the Lord. From a biblical perspective, waiting is the most proactive thing we can do. To wait on the Lord means to get out of the way so God can act. When Jesus stood before his accusers, he did not retaliate. If you think it's easy to keep silent, when people are, you know, when you're facing false accusations, let me tell you, you know, you might think it's easy, but it's not. With, with that as background, we turn our, to our text where James shows us three ways to wait when hard times hit. Remember that he is writing to the believers in the first century, and they were, they were poor, they were, they were struggling, they, they were scattered across Roman Empire. They had been abused, lied to, exploited, especially by wealthy landowners who ripped them off, stole their money, and walked away laughing. They were at the mercy of rich men who, who got away with murder, both figuratively and literally. And there was nothing they could do about it. What does the word say to those who are cheated? How do we respond in godly fashion when we are mistreated? How do we keep our faith alive when hard times seem to have no end? Right now, we, we really don't know when quarantine will be lifted. We don't know when the vaccine for COVID-19 will come out. Waiting doesn't come easy. Let us read our text for today, James 5, 7 to 11. Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. For examples of patience in suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end, for the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. The title of our message is 
wait when hard times hit. Let us pray. Lord, we ask you to speak to your people today. Allow, Lord, your people, O oh God, just to concentrate, O oh God, Lord, on your word. Whatever they're doing at home, I pray that they will set aside everything and they will just sit, O oh God, wherever they are. And Lord, I pray that our brothers and sisters in Christ will be able to focus on your word. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will just consume every member of the family, O oh God. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. James says we must learn to wait on the Lord. The operative word is learn. Waiting doesn't come easy for most of us. No one wants to wait when your loved ones are suffering or when you are being mistreated. Yet often, that is what we must do. Life isn't fair. When that unfairness happens to us, we want to shout, I didn't sign up for this. What do we do then? Let's walk through this message and see three ways we are to wait when hard times hit. First, wait expectantly. Verses 7 to 8, Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest, harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. Consider the farmer. That's a noble profession. We wouldn't eat if there weren't farmers to grow the crops and tend the, the cows, the chickens, the pigs. Farming is hard work, which is why not many people, um, that's why most, a lot of people don't want to do it anymore. Today's farmer must be an economist, financier, business executive, and computer expert on top of all the things he has to know about growing crops and raising animals. The farmer must have an extra dose of patience because an impatient farmer will lose his resources. James wants us to think about the farmer who waits for early rain in the fall and the latter rain in the spring. For us here in the Philippines, uh, the farmers wait for rainy days and prays that storms won't come and destroy his crops. He digs the ground, plants the seed, pulls the weed, and then he waits. That's all he can do. He cannot make the rain come any sooner. But he knows if he waits, the rain will eventually come. When James says, be patient, he uses a word that is sometimes translated as long-suffering. The only problem is, no one wants to suffer. How much more for long suffering? Short suffering? Maybe. We're okay with that. But long suffering? Lord, that's for someone else, not for me. Go back to the illustration of the farmer. He endures droughts, attacks of bugs, uh, animals that eat his crops. He, he may be attacked by robbers or NPA who, who come at night and, and steal his animals. But the farmer fights through it all because he knows the rain must come eventually. The drought cannot last forever. The farmer must be patient during the drought by reminding himself the latter rains will come soon. The phrase, take courage, translates a word that means immovable. It describes a person who is so certain about the future that he cannot be moved by the troubles of the present. Apply that to our attitude during hard times, especially when we've been badly treated. Nowadays, we can be badly treated by our boss, by our customer, by our client, our colleagues. We must remind ourselves, Jesus is coming again. 
But the text says even more than that. Verse 8, the Lord's coming is near. You know, one translation gives us the exact meaning of the text, contemporary English version. It says here, be patient like those farmers and don't give up. The Lord will, be, uh, will soon be here. I read a story about a businessman who, who having, having an errand to, to run at his office, took his young son along with him. He asked the boy to wait on the stairs while he went inside to do his work. Soon, he became so engrossed with his business that he forgot about his son waiting outside. Leaving the building by a different door, he went home alone. When the family sat down to dinner, the son was not present. His mother became anxious and wondered where he might be. Then the father remembered where he'd left his son. Hurrying back to his place of work, he found his son tired and hungry, waiting as he had been instructed to do. The son just said, I knew you would come, Dad. You said you would. Folks, Jesus is coming soon. And he said so. 2,000 years have passed since Jesus went to heaven, and, and some of God's children feel tired and hungry. We wonder why Jesus hasn't come back yet. Perhaps you're thinking he has forgotten us. Maybe he made other plans. If you feel like that little boy, let me tell you, take courage. It's been a long time from our point of view, but God's only been gone for two days in heaven's perspective. What do I mean? Second Peter 3 verse 8, But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. Jesus said he would come back and he will. Let me tell you that again, okay? Let me emphasize on that again. Jesus promised that he will come back. And let me tell you, he will come back again. Fear not. Fear not. Children of God, keep believing he hasn't forgotten you. Soon Christ will return for his children. How should we wait during hard times? James said, wait expectantly. Christ is coming back, and when he does, he will set things right. Second, wait graciously. Verse 9, don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, so, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. Here is a warning we all need to heed. Perhaps we can state it this way. When you are tired, when you are scared, when you are angry, when you feel you are pressed into a corner, when life tumbles in around you, when you are betrayed, attacked, harassed, lied to, and lied about, when your world turns upside down, let me tell you, guard your mouth. The word translated grumble means to groan or to sigh. It's what you do when you've had, just, you, you've had just about enough and you don't feel like taking it anymore. We usually grumble when we have had enough. Why do people grumble? We think they have more money, they, they are happily married, they have perfect children, they don't treat you right, they look at you the wrong way, they don't respect you. On and on it goes. Folks, when you are tired, scared, and angry, it's easy to get hypercritical of the people you love the most. It's odd, isn't it? If we walk down the street and someone we don't know shouts an insult at us, maybe we'll laugh it off and move on. But let your spouse say or do one wrong thing. Let your kids get on your one last nerve. Let your friends at church not respond the way you want them to. Well, what happens then? You blow up, you lose your cool, 
you say something foolish. Grumbling can destroy your marriage. James says, don't do it. Don't give in to your anger. Your, your grumbling can destroy your marriage, tear your family apart, and destroy your closest friendships. Instead, love must cover a multitude of sins because there is a multitude of sins that need covering. Usually, it's not the big stuff that tips us up. It's the little, little things the sand in the shoe, the irritating mannerism, the joke that wasn't a joke, the, the way they looked at you, the, the perceived insult that stays in your mind. If you look for reasons to grumble, let me tell you, you'll find them soon enough. Even the best friends will let us down. Spouses get on each other's nerve all the time. And the kids... Well, the kids can drive you crazy, especially now that you're with them most of the time. Notice the reason James gives in verse 9. Do not grumble or you will be judged. Ouch. Fault finders will be judged. The critic will be criticized. Filipinos would say the judger will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Those who judge will be judged. What judge? He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're all familiar with the image of Christ standing at the door, knocking and waiting for us to open the door, which you can find in Revelation 3 verse 20. It's a beautiful, a beautiful picture of the Lord waiting to enter and have fellowship with us. James gives us the flip side of the sin. Christ stands at the door, ready to come in and judge those who are good at judging others. God will personally expose our critical spirit and our bitter words we thought no one noticed. Perhaps this is what John means when he warns believers to stay close to Christ so that we will not shrink back in shame at His coming. You can find that in 1 John 2 verse 28. We often look at the second coming as our blessed hope, which it is, and overlook the fact that the coming of Christ leads to a time of examination of every Christian. When, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the worthless, worthless things we have done, the wood, the hay, the stubble, will be burned up. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. That won't be a pleasant moment for any of us because we all have wood, hay, and stubble than we think. Grumblers will answer to the Lord and He's not accepting any excuses. So here's a question to ponder. Can I maintain a gentle spirit when hard times hit? And if I can smile, can I at least refrain from snapping at my loved ones? Grumbling splits churches. Nothing destroys Christian unity quicker than a grumbling spirit. How many churches have been split? How many good ministries ruined? How many servants of the Lord have been injured because of the thoughtless grumbling of other believers? Brothers and sisters, think about these things. When hard times hit, we must first wait expectantly and then graciously. But James has one more challenge to set before us. And that is, wait patiently. Verses 10 to 11, for examples of patience in suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end. For the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. Friends, sometimes victory looks like survival. And survival looks like victory. Sometimes the only thing we can do is hang on. That's why God blesses those 
who persevere. The Lord honors those who keep believing when it would be much easier to walk away. Consider the prophets. Jesus, uh, the prophets, James says, and he, he, he said, they spoke in the name of the Lord, but what happened to them? As a group, they were maligned, attacked, criticized. They are the ones who the writer of Hebrews said, like they, 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 they were the ones who have, who have devoted their life to the Lord and they suffered a lot. We can find this in Hebrews 11, verses 35 to 38. Some women received their loved ones back from death. Many of these people were tortured, but they refused to be released. They were sure that they would get a better reward when the dead are raised to life. Verse 36. Others were made fun of and beaten with whips, and some were chained in jail. Still others were stoned to death or sawed in, in, in two or killed with swords. Some had nothing but sheepskins or goatskins to wear. They were poor, mistreated, and tortured. The world did not deserve these good people who had to wander in deserts and on mountains and had to live in caves and holes in the ground. Do you know that these are happening now around the world? Pastor Evelyn Martin told me how difficult it is right now to minister to, to, uh, to Nepal and uh, China, in, in Nepal and China. Pastor Rafi Farda of Word for the World Hong Kong is praying because, uh, uh, because Hong Kong will be taken over by China because of what's happening in Hong Kong right now. And we know that China is not open to religion. Many Christians are being persecuted. They are the believers in Nigeria, India, Indonesia, and other Hindu and Muslim countries who at this moment are being harassed, beaten, and sometimes even killed because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Then James asked us to consider Job, a righteous man whose soul was put to the test through the waves of hardship that hit him one after another. Though he was cast down and discouraged, he never gave up on his faith. When his wife urged him, hey, curse God, he never did. He decided to bless the Lord despite his situation. How did the prophet survive? How did Job survive? How will we survive? They survived because they knew who God was. Everything in life comes down to one question. One question. What do you believe about God? What sort of God is He? How has He revealed Himself in the Bible? Friends, you may learn about God in the sunshine, but you discover your God at midnight. I love that. Let me, let me, let me emphasize emphasize on that okay post it on your facebook you may learn about god in the sunshine but you discover your god at midnight jo job and the prophets understood that the lord is full of tenderness and mercy that phrase full of tenderness translate a greek word used only here in the new testament you could translate it as exceedingly compassionate Job ended up with more than he started with, but he had to go through a terrible trial to receive it. The prophets also suffered in the name of the Lord. Sometimes they received their reward in this life, but more often it came in the next life when they saw the Lord face to face. Let me wrap up our message today. How will we survive when hard times hit? How will we survive if the operation of our business or work is not yet normal? It all depends on our view of God. Is your God full of tenderness and overflowing with mercy? Is that your God? If so, you may be knocked down by circumstances, but you won't stay down forever because the Lord will pick you up. 
Sometimes victory looks a lot like survival, and survival looks a lot like victory. I find it encouraging that James doesn't offer his readers an easy way out of their troubles. He doesn't say, pray this prayer and your problems will vanish. Pray this prayer and your sickness will be gone. James is too honest for that. Life isn't fair. Sometimes we can do anything about that, but we can control how we respond. Life isn't fair. If we believe God is in control of our lives, and if we believe our enemies couldn't trouble us without God's permission, and if we believe that the Lord is full of compassion and mercy, if we believe Jesus is coming back soon, if we believe all of that, we will find a way to hang on. We will be patient. We will not grumble. And we will stand firm by the grace of God. You may be waiting on God right now. What should you do? Here's my advice. Don't fret. Don't panic. Don't take matters into your own hands. Do your duty each day as God shows it to you. Surrender your life to the Lord and say to the Lord, Lord, your will be done. The issue is God. When you wait on the Lord, you are saying, I know God is going to resolve this situation. I don't know how and I don't know when, but I know He's going to do it. I'm not giving up. I'm waiting on Him. Friends, if it's your first time to join us in Word for the World Christian Fellowship, maybe you have a religion, but you don't have relationship with Him. I know you are waiting for something. I know you've been praying for something. But let me tell you today, what's more important is your relationship with God. And today, I would like to give you an opportunity to have relationship with Jesus. What you have to do is just pray this prayer with me and pray it coming from your heart. Is that okay? Pray with me. Repeat after me. And pray coming from your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for teaching me how to wait. Lord, I know waiting is hard. But with you, I know it, it would be easier. Lord, thank you for your word today. And I pray that I will wait expectantly. I will wait graciously. And I will wait patiently. Today, O oh God, forgive me, O oh God, for all my sins. Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Holy Spirit, guide me every day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you pray that prayer, let me tell you, the angels in the heaven is rejoicing with us. And you know what? Remember the day today because today is a day that your name is written in the book of life. Friends, may God make us strong and give us the grace to endure in this time of pandemic. May our faith grow as we wait on the Lord. The issue is not about your problem. The issue is God. If God is who He says He is, then you've got every reason to keep believing when hard times hit. Take heart, child of God. When the Lord's purposes are finally made clear, you'll be glad you didn't cut and run. That's it for today. Thank you for joining me. I pray that you will press the share button and share them 
with your friends and loved ones. God bless you. See you next Sunday. Bye.